Chapter 15: The Gulf Breeze Conference. A few years ago, I spoke at the annual Gulf Breeze UFO Conference, one of the largest East Coast meetings. Normally, I'm not invited to such groups, since the main speakers are usually ex-military, hard evidence UFO experts who lead the charge for government disclosure, abduction researchers and experiencers, and a potpourri of saucer videos, hypnotic regression tales, and cases of direct contact. You will almost never find ET channels at these conferences, and no discussion of walk-ins, wanderers, or ET family. Although cosmic matters are their bread and butter, these gatherings are usually quite low on serious metaphysics. Unfortunately, most so-called UFO experts have little understanding and even less appreciation of spiritual principles, so they can't see cosmic contact from the perspective of soul evolution. Proceeding from a rational materialist bias, their trail goes round and round, and the major topics discussed at UFO conferences today are about the same as they were ten years ago. And so, if I'm not invited to speak, I rarely attend such meetings. While it's interesting to hear about the latest cover-up, secret evil project, or doom and gloom prediction, it's not worth sitting through all the excess wondering. Frankly, it's painful for me to watch them flailing about the confusion between positive-negative ET agendas, the childish hope that humanity will wake up when human leaders are forced to reveal UFO data, and the near-total lack of spiritual focus. There is generally no understanding of path, meditation, and the glory of real cosmic design. However, what is really hard for me at these conferences is the complete reversal of what the UFO ET contact phenomenon is all about, spiritual assistance to humanity and the importance of love. For better or worse, you'll find more talk of love and compassion among your typical Sunday churchgoers than among most veteran UFO researchers. Nevertheless, when I was asked to speak at this conference, I immediately accepted. If they wanted me, then maybe they are more open than I thought. Actually, since I had been recommended to the main organizer, Vicki Lyons, by Michael Lindemann, a respected UFO researcher and friend, I came in on a red carpet. As the I Ching, or ancient Chinese divination book says, I was a, quote, weak line in a strong place, a relative unknown among big-name researchers. But, surprisingly, I became the featured attraction at the conference. Vicki Lyons appreciated my approach so much that she kept me in the spotlight, letting me give lead-off presentations both Friday and Saturday mornings, and having me moderate the speaker panel on the last night. Everything was arranged, with a little help from upstairs, I assume, to give me maximum exposure to present the spiritual purpose and value of the UFO presence on Earth. Perhaps the time was right for some deeper information on cosmic purpose. Since mine was the first lecture on the first day, the hall was packed with nearly 500 people, and though they had to pay extra, about 350 people came to my workshop, more than I had ever had before. I was quite surprised, but as I learned later, many people appreciated my presentation, and dozens came up to thank me later in the weekend. They really got it. As for the other presenters, they really did not get it, which was not much of a surprise. Representing the abduction issue, there were Bud Hopkins and Professor David Jacobs, both of whom certainly have no sugary illusions about the visitors. On the contrary, they painted a dire picture of ruthless alien intent, mind control abuse, hybrid agendas, and approaching world conquest. Understandably, they consider negative ETs unstoppable, they have no idea about spiritual protection, and have naught to say about benevolent ET groups. Though both of these researchers are sincere and do care about those that they are treating, because they don't have much interest in divine power or higher self, they've only got half the picture, the dark half. And in the shadows, as usual, nothing is clearly seen. Also in shadows, with apparent good intent, there was Linda Moulton Howe, a well-known author and film producer. She's quite famous in the UFO research community and has had a regular place on the Art Bell show. She did her initial work on the cattle mutilation phenomenon and has expanded out from there. Today, she's deep in the black world of covert projects and shadowy government agents who sometimes support her work. They give her tidbits on underground bases, secret groups, high-tech weapons, and the great mighty power of ETs who had evidence, it was claimed, of having genetically mastered our race. Sounds like negative source disinformation to you? 
Of course, Miss Howe eagerly relayed these secret bits of information and didn't seem to worry about the possibility that she was being led astray by some of her contacts. She truly believes her material is essential, since it presumably helps us understand covert government complicity. Unfortunately, it does little to help us understand ourselves. Her oversight came into focus for me as she continued the presentation. She showed us dozens of photos of recent UK crop circles, the latest batch which is no less than holy, and after that proceeded to report a new abduction case in all its gory details. She then suggested that both forms of ET contact may well come from the same source. This struck me like a hammer as the summit of non-discernment, complete blindness to vastly different forms of influence, to equate crop circles with abduction, not recognizing the enormous difference in consciousness between them, sacred cosmic geometry on the one hand versus traumatic scarring soul abuse on the other, was simply amazing to me. I was really shocked. That a famous UFO researcher could entertain this notion, continue to sell books and be invited to conference all around the world, makes me want to go back to the monastery. No wonder so many people are confused when those at the top have so little discernment. I understand why the Buddha's first thought upon realizing enlightenment was that no one would understand him if he opened his mouth. I guess appreciation for subtle spiritual truth has always been rare. But Linda Howe, Dr. David Jacobs, and Bud Hopkins were not alone, as I found out during the speaker panel, billed as a dialogue on alien agendas, the question of good and evil. I had hoped in my capacity as moderator to tease out so-called expert opinions and provoke a lively debate. On the contrary, almost none of the speakers had any conclusions, and when it came time for audience Q&A, not a single person even addressed the issue of polarity. They simply asked individual speakers about their own individual work. It was no group event at all. Interestingly, a favorite speaker analogy used to support their non-position on cosmic polarity was to compare ET human relations with our treatment of animals. It goes something like this, quote, Cows may think we're evil, but we eat them just to stay alive. We don't hate them. Arctic seals may be terrorized, but we're just tagging them to track global pollution. Beasts may call us satanic, but they're just ignorant. It's all for their own good, end quote. And so goes one expert opinion on abducting ET motives. Of course, the analogy is far off base, since there's a major difference in consciousness between humans and animals. As self-conscious souls, we are absolutely equal in our essence to any and all ET groups. But since many UFO researchers have little soul awareness and little interest in the metaphysics of cosmic law, the fine points of universal morality, human free will, and spiritually polarized agendas are lost on them. Indeed, without soul awareness, humans are just like animals. And metaphysically, this is exactly the true point of difference between these two kingdoms, animal and human. In fact, it is just this distinction that negative ETs hope to blur. Indeed, Ron noted point blank that true abduction is, quote, a means of terrorizing or terrifying the individual and causing it to feel the feelings of an advanced second-density being such as a laboratory animal, end quote. Unfortunately, as the so-called UFO experts equate the human treatment of animals with the rough handling of abductees by abusive aliens, it supports this very same negative ET agenda. In making people feel like animals, obviously those aliens have been somewhat successful. So while much of the audience appreciated the light I was shining, most of the speakers on stage, frankly, could not see it, or so it seemed. And they are supposed to be the experts. All in all, however, I considered the conference a great success, and I was very pleased to have been invited. It was really nice to see that most people had a pure desire to learn, and their seeking was truly spiritual. I can only hope that this continues and grows in the UFO research community, making the union of material evidence and careful metaphysics. Only through such integration can we truly understand the uniqueness of the present time. In the next chapter, we will revisit a somewhat sad story of the Heaven's Gate group, another case of grossly mistaken metaphysics.